Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. All right? Let's take a look at it. And we're looking at the mystical application of the book of Revelation. And what you'll find as you go along with us on the nights that we cover Revelation here, the book of Revelation is a mystical description of the functionings of your body. It has nothing to do with Armageddon's outside. It has to do with the Armageddon in here. Okay? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. A door being opened in heaven means that the opening of the higher realm of consciousness is now apparent to you through your meditation. Remember, heaven is God's kingdom. Luke 17, 21, Jesus says, the kingdom is within you. Therefore, a door opening up in heaven is an aspect of consciousness opening up within you. And the first voice I heard was out of a trumpet. Now, the reason the trumpet is because the breath blows the trumpet, and the trumpet is representative of spirit that brings what? Music, harmony. See, the voice, that was the impulse that was bringing harmony to your life, which comes from the heavenly consciousness or the higher consciousness. Uh, as it were of a trumpet talking with me, it says, Come up higher and come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. See? So now here, John, or we actually, who were perishing in our lower minds, upon feeling the impulse of this spirit breath in the higher consciousness heaven, and starting to feel this movement of harmony, a harmonious spirit within us, are then asked to come up to the high place of the Holy Spirit. And come up hither means come up higher, and I'll show you things which must be, which means I'll show you what will happen to you. A lot of folks who interpret the book of Revelation make a serious mistake in that they think it's talking about nations fighting each other and things that are going to happen in the future. It all has to do with things that will happen to you if you'll comply with the instructions in the book of Revelation, and all of those instructions are mystical. So it says, come up higher. In Genesis 19.17, it says, escape to the mountain. All of these aspects are used to note that. In Exodus 3.12, it says, you shall serve God upon this mountain. It doesn't mean a mountain. A mountain has nothing to do with it. The mountain is used as a symbol because it is the high place, and the high place is simply the higher consciousness. That higher consciousness within you is heaven, the lower consciousness within you is hell. That's why hell's down below and heaven's up above. But most folks look at it, well, somewhere in the universe. No, somewhere inside of you. Isaiah 2.2, 2, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. Now that means the higher consciousness. Uh, Carl Jung referred to it as the super consciousness. There is a part of you that you know nothing about, which is the God part. It's the mountain part. And when you ascend in meditation up to the higher realms of consciousness, you're ascending up to the mountain. Psalm 61.2 says, lead me to that rock that is higher than I. Let's pause at that minute. Let's take a look at the word rock. Okay, when Jacob said, I have seen God face to face, he said, I will call the place pineal. That's the pineal gland of the brain. When that is unregenerated, it is a sandy consistency. When it is regenerated through stimulation, it becomes as a stone or a rock. It's called the, the stone that the builders rejected. So lead me to that rock that is higher. And that is saying simply that when we stimulate that which is the pineal gland through meditation, it releases those hormones and releases those things which heal and open up the right hemisphere of the brain. Okay. And of course, when we talk about the mountain, we talk about the higher place, we talk about the higher elevations, we cannot forget Luke 22, 12, where Jesus says, He shall show you a large upper room furnished. Who shall? The man with the pitcher of water, meaning Aquarius. Jesus was saying in Luke 22, 10, when you see the man with the pitcher of water, enter into the house, go to the upper room. That was a prophecy of the Aquarian age which we are entering now. During the Aquarian Age, at the time of the Aquarian Age, Jesus is saying people will enter into themselves and they will go to the higher consciousness and then I will be there. That's where Christ consciousness is located. Okay? But of course, there's another statement. In Proverbs 24, 7, it says, Wisdom is too high for a fool. Wisdom is too high for a fool. And unfortunately, most of Christianity knows nothing of this. Actually, most of Christianity says when Jesus took the disciples to the upper room, 
that means the second floor in a house somewhere. That's the way they interpret it. It doesn't mean that. It means he takes those who discipline themselves, disciples, to meditate, as he said, practice the single eye. He takes them to an upper room, which is the higher consciousness, and there he meets with them, because it is in the higher consciousness where you touch God. When you raise yourself above the thoughts of the lower mind, you then enter symbolically into the upper room, into the higher realms of consciousness. So in Revelation 4.1, when it says, come up higher, I will show you things to come, that's for you now. If you'll ever have the courage to abandon all of this religious stuff, to turn your back on religion and turn yourself to Jesus Christ and obey him. I had, I get a kick out of that. A few weeks ago, or days ago, somebody uh, called on our answer machine and they were playing this song, Jesus, what a wonder you are. You know, I always get these anonymous things from born again Christians. I don't know what Christians are afraid of. But anyhow, that's, all of their stuff is always anonymous, you know. And somebody's playing this record over the answering machine, Jesus, what a wonder you are. And I thought to myself, Jesus, what a wonder you are. What's a wonder you don't obey him? Because all they do is play his songs and read about it, but they don't do what he said to do. That's what Jesus himself said. Why do you call me Lord and not do what I told you to do? And Jesus told you, practice the single eye. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. That means if you meditate above the thoughts of the mind, you'll come up higher into the upper room of divine consciousness and you'll be able to open to the right hemisphere of the brain and sit at the right hand of power. Now listen to this, when you respond to that call to come up higher, to rise in thoughtless meditation, then John shows you what happens. And that's what we do on Tuesday nights, thoughtless meditation. Revelation chapter 4 verse 2. John says, and immediately I was in the spirit. Bang. Do you see that? Here we've gone through this first part of Revelation 4.1 saying, come up higher. I described to you about the mountains. I described to you the upper room. When you respond to that inner voice, what they call the trumpet, meaning that which is the breath or the spirit which brings harmony to your mind. When you respond to that and you come up higher, you raise yourself from your lower carnal mind above the thoughts of the mind up into the higher consciousness. Then Paul says, and immediately I was in the spirit. The Spirit is only one place, and you call it the Holy Spirit. That means it is separated from the thoughts of your mind. Uh, Romans 8, 7 says the carnal mind is the enemy of God. Jesus in Matthew 6, 25 to 6, 33 says take no thought. He doesn't say don't worry. He says take no thought. Why? Because thoughts come out of your carnal mind. And all of Christianity teaches you should pray with your mind. And what is that? You're praying with God's enemy. And so you're asking for a lot of stuff. You're begging for a lot of stuff. You're telling God what to do when we have totally screwed up the world as it is. Instead of doing what Jesus says and going to the upper room, which is the higher consciousness, above the realm of human thought. Yes, it can be done. You can raise yourself above thought. And when there are no thoughts in you, then all that is left is God. And that's everything. Now, Revelation 4, 2, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Where is heaven? Jesus Christ said, the kingdom of God is within you. Heaven is God's kingdom. So when he raises himself through this meditation up to the throne, he's raising himself to the higher consciousness. And now we're going to see mystical numerology. It says, behold, and one sat on the throne. One is God. One is the mystical number for God. Two is you and God. Three is new life, resurrection. Four is your fourfold nature. Five is your five senses and sacrifice. Six is works and doctrines. Seven is the divine intervention of God. Eight is rupture. Nine is human consciousness. Ten is completion. And uh, nobody ever said what eleven is. It's God and you, I guess, too. But twelve is perfection in Hebrew. One is God. So it says one sat on the throne. See? See, now you can see by the single eye. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. If your eye be single, you perceive the oneness. One. Oneness with God. And that's why God's name is I Am. Because when you meditate, you eliminate the thoughts of your mind. Now, you are no longer there because there are no thoughts there. Your body is there, sure, but not you. 
Because that inner part, that, that you, that spirit you, that self you, is shut down and all there is, is nothingness. And where there is nothingness inside of you now, there is God, which is everything. Because you've taken yourself out of the way. You've crucified the five senses and what is left is God. So now you've come into that oneness where it is not that you're God, but God is you. Because there are no human thoughts inside of your head. Now the only thing can be in there is God. Universal, cosmic, celestial God. See? Revelation 4, 3, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardine stone. Now we're going to enter into the ancient mysticism of color, of gems. Look what it says here. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. So we're getting into color, we're getting into gems, we're getting into the rainbow. And if your eye be single, we can show you a lot of very interesting things. First of all, you should get yourself a crystal. You should start looking at the beautiful stones that are available because the Bible talks about them. And go into these stone shops, these New Age rocks, and get them. They, they carry a tremendous amount of beautiful energy and they do have different powers. It's not supernatural powers, it's very natural. Like God, mold becomes penicillin. I mean, you know, if it says it in the Bible, don't be afraid of it. Christianity makes you afraid of nature. Forget it. Get one with nature by coming one with Christ and understanding these things. So as we prepare to look deeply into the significance of the rainbow, let's do that first. The rainbow in mysticism in, in ancient religions symbolizes a bridge, okay, between you and God. That's what a rainbow is. It symbolizes a bridge between the lower mind and the higher mind. That's the rainbow. And that's why people would always say there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow because gold is the color of God. You know, the streets of gold. And, and that's the significance. And so when we look into this, it's quite important because in addition to the rainbow in Revelation 4, 3, it says we have the gems of jasper, a sardine stone, and emerald. And what they represent, all stones in the Bible represent things. And that comes out of the most ancient places of the East. These stones represent the virtues of the higher consciousness of the mind and the emotions. Now, in the ancient words, karita, K-A-R-I-T-A, -A, it says, in that city shining with the splendor of gems, darkness like poverty could find no place. So gems and precious stones each have an individual meaning in mysticism. And if you don't begin to understand them, there's no sense of looking at the book of Revelation. There's no sense really looking at the Bible. So he's Revelation 4, 3, he that sat was to look upon like a jasper or a sardine stone. See, this is celestial imagery. Okay, a lot of people say, well, you know, you shouldn't get into that imagery. You should, because that's what it says in the Bible. He that sat was to look upon like a jasper or a sardine stone. He looked like a jasper or a sardine stone. This is in a dream state or a trance state or in deep meditation. Okay. Now the sardine is a deep orange and red. The jasper is a blue-green kind of aqua. And so now we have a description of God consciousness. This is a description of the effects of the higher nature of your being. And let's take a look at it, if you would, with me, and you'll get a better idea of how to approach mysticism in the Bible in the book of Revelation. Okay, the color rose red. Okay, rose red means love. And these go back for the most ancient of times. Fiery red is ambition or emotions. Ambition, emotion, okay? Now we have scarlet, which is energy, life. Is that coming out dark enough, Franklin? A little light, is it? Maybe I'll yeah, maybe I'll try this one. Okay. Yellow, okay? That's kingship. Okay, it's like God's throne is gold. Green, astral, growth. That's growth of consciousness. So we'll put consciousness and growth. That's why they, you know, in, in the biblical stories, the sheep feed in the fields. Blue is intellect and peace, but it's intellect. What else we got? Purple is wisdom. Okay, white is purity and perfection, we'll call it perfection. That's why Jesus comes on a white horse. That means consciousness, which is beyond uh, that of uh, thought. 
and black is potential or ignorance, darkness, etc. Okay? So, now let's take a look at it before we go away, Franks. Yellow, it says here that he that sat upon was like in sight like unto an emerald. Okay? Now if we look, the uh, emerald is a, is a, a greenish color. Okay? And uh, the sardine is a yellow red or an orange red. So here then, if it says, uh, he that sat was like upon a jasper or sardine stone. That's what I'm looking about. Revelation 4.3. Jasper is green. And okay, and where we have green is the growth of divine consciousness in understanding and teaching. Because it's a blue-green. It's an aqua. So there you have understanding. You have intellect and conscious growth. And then you have the sardine stone, which is yellow and red an orange and red, and that red gives you uh, ambition or power over the lower things, and the yellow red, which is the rose red with the kingship of God, it's the love of God which gives you power over the emotions, and of course the divine wisdom which gives you conscious growth. So there you then see about the renewed mind and why it says, he that sat was to look like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there both of them tell us that what it's simply saying in mysticism is that there is a, a control, okay, a, 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 a godliness that brings love to give you control over the emotions and a divine intellect that provides you with a growth, a growth of consciousness in understanding things and an understanding God. That's how they use stones and that's why it's so important if you read the Bible a lot of times you read in the Old Testament about the various stones and the, the gems that are in the breastplate of the high priest, and you just go on and read it. Well, you can't. you got to stop and find out what those stones mean to, to understand, because it's all written in symbols. It's all written in symbols. So then your meditation, now this is what's happening here. John's meditation brings him into this higher consciousness, which provides this, which is love, which is above the human plane, that gives power over the physical problems. That's what it tells us about the jasper and sardine stone. Now in Revelation 4, 3, go back again, there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Okay? Now this is a, this is a beautiful picture of color. It symbolizes... Uh, to people who lift themselves into a higher realm of consciousness. This entire beautiful experience, according to John, is like emerald. Now come back here for a minute, uh, 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 Frank. Emerald is green. It's a very deep green. And green is for the growth of consciousness, the growth of understanding. So the Bible here confirms everything that we've said before. Heaven is a state of growth into the higher or astral Consciousness. It's actually meeting Christ in the air, no doubt about it, in consciousness. But then, again, there was a rainbow round about, round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And they're telling you in mysticism in, in the book of Revelation, emerald, because emerald is a symbol of conscious growth. Okay. Now, let's look again and, and take one last look at the mystical significance of the rainbow. And, and I think that's important to see because it says again in Revelation uh, 4.3, uh, there was a rainbow round about the throne. A rainbow, as we said, is a bridge between the higher and the lower emotions. That's the carnal mind and the, uh, the uh, divine mind. It's, it's the way for you to get from the lower to God. Okay? It's that which connects the earth with heaven, you with God. Now, let's come back for a minute. Let's think, what is a rainbow? So now, let's get some understanding here as to why the word rainbow is used in the Bible in the book of Revelation. Before we do that, I just, we went a little bit far. I want to tell you, uh, this is coming to you from the Christian Village Church in Forked River. We have, for those of you who cannot get down to the church, a TV network. Each month, we'll send you a, uh, video, a VCR tape for your videotape recorder. And it has teachings on it live from the church. I mean, it's one thing doing this in a studio setting, but when we do it live from the church, it's, it, it has a much more tremendous impact. If you'd like to get on our network, this is what you do. You write this telephone number down, 609-971-0537. And then, at the end of the program, we've got a reflection in there, Frank, but at the end of the program, uh, 
call that number and say, leave your name, address, and telephone number. Say you want to be on the TV network. There is no charge for these videotapes each month. All we ask you to do is when you get one, after you're finished with it, send it on to the next person whose name we'll give you. All right? Let's real quickly then, because we're running out of time, take a look at a rainbow. What is a rainbow? And why is a rainbow used in a Bible as a symbolic uh, reference? A rainbow is caused by a reflection of the sun. All right? Let's do that. The rainbow is caused by a reflection of the sun. That's Christ. We have to have the sun, S-O-N, S-U-N, Christ, okay? It's a reflection of the sun through drops of water. Water is truth. All right? So now we have truth being reflected through Christ consciousness, and it comes from a cloud, doesn't it? The water comes from the cloud. The cloud means the unseen spirit. So we have the water, which is truth, coming from a cloud, which is the unseen spirit. And then the reflection being reflected through that, that truth is the light of Christ. Okay? The unseen spirit in the higher consciousness. And when we finally allow that reflection of the sun or Christ through the truth of the inner logos, then we cross the bridge to the higher celestial heaven. That's why rainbow is used in the Bible symbolically. Once again, as you know, everything, as Paul said, that is unseen is made known by those things which are seen. So when we see a rainbow, well, we showed you the various colors, what the colors mean. And then in addition to that, when you see a rainbow, you understand that it's used symbolically in the Bible quite often because it represents the bridge from the lower consciousness to the higher consciousness, and it represents water, which is truth, coming from a cloud, which is the unseen spirit. That's why it says we shall rise and meet Jesus in the clouds. It doesn't mean real clouds outside. It means we rise to meet him in the unseen spirit within ourselves. So as this water or truth comes from the unseen spirit within us, it is then reflected by that which is the sun, the light, the Christ consciousness, into our being, and there is the rainbow, and it produces the various colors of love and patience and all of these good things, okay? That's how, that's how, in the ancients, the rainbow is a sign of three principles. Principle one is red, which is God's love and power. Principle two is white and yellow, which is dominion over the lower elements. And principle three is the same as uh, jasper. It's like aqua, blue, or green, the growth of divine understanding. So there is no, nothing in the Bible that you can see that has no meaning. I mean, if it's in the Bible, then you've got to say, why is it there? What, what, what significance does it have? Why is it saying this in the Bible? Most people read, oh, there was a rainbow. How nice that is. No, it, it's, it means something. Say, and the next time you read about a rainbow in the Bible, remember what it is telling you. It's telling you the truth coming from the unseen spirit, bringing through the reflection of the Christ, the sun, the light, and leading you from the lower consciousness up into the higher realms of consciousness. Say. So the, though the cloud of your experience may be dark, your life may be dark, the things that have come against you may be dark, a rainbow suddenly appears amidst the darkness. Even though the lower may hide the rest of that ring, if you seek in obedience to Jesus Christ to find the God presence at the other end of the rainbow, you'll find it. You'll find it. And of course there's also symbolically the bridge and the rainbow is symbolized by the neck. And you'll see in the prodigal son and in Esau and Jacob, they would hug the neck because the neck is that bridge between the consciousness, the head, and that which is the flesh of the physical aspects of the body, the lower aspects. And, 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 and that's uh, Eastern mysticism. That's what the book of Revelation was written from. That's where your Bible was written from. And by westernizing it, we have screwed it up terribly. Let me make a strong suggestion to you. Stay away from those Bibles that make everything easy to understand because they're taking the mystical language out and they're putting in what they think it should mean. That's like if somebody says to you, let's go shoot the bull. Well, you say, we'll not put in that. We'll put in, let's go get a gun and find a big black animal with horns and then we'll kill the animal. So they, they, they describe what it means to shoot a bull, but they missed it because they didn't realize that to shoot the bull means have a conversation. That's what modern translations of the Bible do. They take mystical language, the dark sayings of the ancients, Proverbs 1 6, the parables of Christ, Mark 4 11, okay, the allegories of the Bible, Galatians 4 24. They take all of those things and they 
make them what they think is easy to understand. And what they do is they take away the mystical meaning. So I would suggest you stay with the King James Bible because they just left the original language and, and they left it. They didn't mess with it. The rest of them have got you totally off and screwed up and they don't mean anything of what they say. And there's not one bit of trust you can put in them because they are not based on the ancient mystical teachings. Okay?